All right, good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm going to post a lecture just talking about the census today and go over um, some of that PowerPoint with you guys. I apologize that I haven't been able to hold classes at a regular time, but um, you know, things are what they are right now. Um, the chapter on the census is not all that long and the uh, lab that will go with it has to do with a dissection of the eye, which is really cool. Hopefully you've gotten to see that demo a little bit and, and look through that. Um, I did extend the deadline for the eye dissection by a few days so that you have a little bit of time to do that. So um, what I'm going to do is just share my screen so that we can get right into this PowerPoint. So chapter nine, the general and special senses. So we always cover the nervous system and the senses kind of at the same time or one right after the other. The, ner the senses are really just an extension of the nervous system. And so in the nervous system, we learned about the neurons and how they have dendrites that receive a signal, right? And the signal goes to the cell body and then it moves down the axon. Sensory cells, are really just neurons and their dendrites are modified to pick up a specific sense, right, to detect a specific sense. So sensory receptors are always, senses are always studied with the nervous system because sensory receptors are really just neurons. They just have specialized cell processes, basically specialized dendrites that can receive different uh, inputs. Um, the most simple sensory receptors are called free nerve endings, and they are sensitive to many types, types of stimuli. They are usually really close to the surface of your skin. Um, an example is that one receptor, one free nerve ending, might provide the sensation of pain in response to heat. Um, so like, you know, if you put your hand on a hot stove, um, or chemicals, or pressure, or tissue damage. It, it might be the same exact receptor that responds to all of those things. It's not going to be very specific to a lot of things. There are other receptors that are much more complicated and much more specific, right? So some receptors are sensitive to only one type of stimulus. Um, for example, we have receptors, again, under our skin, a little bit deeper, but they respond to touch. They respond to pressure, right? So they can detect how much pressure is put on your skin. If, if a, a fly lands on your skin, that's very different than, you know, somebody pushing on your skin. That's a, those are very different sensations. And you can detect those differences. But that same receptor won't respond to chemicals. It's only responding to touch. And some receptors have a really complex uh, structure. They, again, usually are only going to receive one type of stimulus. And... You know, these are things that are protected by a lot of accessory cells and a lot of connective tissue that go around them. So visual receptors in the eye and um, mechanical receptors for hearing in the ear. Those are those are the two big ones that come to mind as far as the more complex structures. What's the difference between sensation and perception? Well, sensation is the information that arrives at the central nervous system. So a nerve gets stimulated, stimulated, and that stimulus travels through the nervous system towards your brain um, as an action potential, right? Sensory fibers picked up this action potential, relayed it along this nerve pathway. That's sensation, okay? So in your brain or in your central nervous system, you're picking up information based on the location of that sens sensitive, uh, the location of that stimulus, where it's coming from, what the nature of it is. Perception is conscious awareness of the sensation. And those are two very different things because you can have a sensation getting to your brain or getting to your central nervous system and not be consciously aware of it. Um, as is the case with adaptation. Adaptation is a reduction in sensitivity in the presence of a constant stimulus. Basically, certain senses adapt and certain ones don't. And we'll talk about, as we go through some of these senses, we'll talk about whether or not they adapt. Um, adaptation occurs when the stimulus 
The stimulus activates a sensory neuron and it sends information to your brain. And that stimulus keeps sending information to your brain. And you have that constant stimulus. And after a while, your brain just doesn't do anything with it, right? So one, one sensation that adapts really well is the sensation of temperature, right? Um, and so the example is jumping into a cold lake. It'll feel very cold first at first, but then within a few minutes, not even, it, it will feel okay. It's not going to feel as cold to you. It's going to kind of normalize. Um, you know, this, the same is true when you first go outside in the morning this time of year, right? It's, it feels really cold. And then, okay, you, you know, you kind of warm up and you're, you're okay with it. So temperature adapts. Um, smell adapts really well. You could walk into Yankee Candle, right? And everything starts to smell the same after a while. Um, the certain types of light touch, light pressure adapts. Here's a good example of it. You can fall asleep, right? Many of us fall asleep on our side with our hand under our pillow. Now what's happening is your head, the weight of your head is putting pressure on your hand, right? And that stimulus is going up your arm into your brain saying, okay, something's pushing on your hand, but you're not moving, you're asleep. So that weight, that pressure, that stimulus is constant. And eventually what happens? Eventually your brain adapts to it. So eventually your hand goes numb, right? You stop feeling that sensation coming from your hand because you're not doing anything about it. So your brain, your brain stops paying attention to it. And only when you move again and you get kind of a different stimulus going, do you feel the sensation of pins and needles, right? You feel the, the um, stimulation coming back into your hand. So that's another good example of adaptation. Basically, there's a reduction of the amount of information arriving at your brain because you're not doing anything about it, right? You jump into a cold lake, your brain immediately says it's too cold, get out. If you don't get out, after a while your brain says, okay, I guess, I guess we're staying here, right? And we'll start ignoring that sense. Before we talk about some of these senses, um, we have to distinguish between general senses and special senses. General senses are uh, brought about by receptors that occur all throughout the body. So things like temperature, pain, touch, pressure, vibration. We have, we have sensory receptors for those all throughout our body, head to toe, um, and proprioception, which is knowing your body's position in space. So we have those those sensations coming from everywhere in our body, right? Those are our general senses. They get to our brain. Our brain has to not only interpret that sensation, but where it's coming from. Then we have special senses. The difference is special senses have receptors that are concentrated in one area of the body, right? And that's the only area that you have that sensation. So there are these five special senses. There is smell, taste, vision, hearing, and equilibrium. Equilibrium is the one that we don't grow up hearing about, right? You hear about sense of smell, sense of taste, sense of vision, sense of hearing, and equilibrium is actually in your ears as well. Um, those are the only places that you have those senses. So vision is only in your eyes. You can't see all throughout your body, head to toe, you can only see with your eyes. So this chapter starts off with general sense receptors. There are different classes of them. So remember, these receptors are just modified neurons. They're neurons whose dendrites are modified to pick up a specific sensation. So we have nociceptors, which respond to pain. We have thermoreceptors. So thermo tells you it responds to temperature. Mechanoreceptors. Mechanoreceptors respond to something moving. So those are things that sense things like uh, touch, pressure, body position. And chemoreceptors, the beginning of that word, chemo tells you it responds to chemicals. And so it goes into a few things about each of those. It goes into this a little bit deeper. Uh, nociceptors, again, detect pain. They adapt very slowly, right? You don't want to adapt to pain. You don't want your brain to stop paying attention to that signal coming from, from somewhere in your body that you're having pain, you're experiencing pain. 
because it is a sensation that is needed. It's necessary. You need to know that there's pain coming from that area to avoid whatever's causing the pain. Um, these are these type of receptors are uncommon in deep tissues and like inside your organs, your deep organs. Um, so they can respond to extremes of temperature. So either really hot or really cold um, or mechanical damage. You know, you, you drop something heavy on your foot and you'll, you'll feel pain or dissolved chemicals. There are chemicals that trigger pain receptors. Thermoreceptors detect temperature. Um, we have them in our dermis, which is our, a layer of our skin. We have them in our skeletal muscles, our liver, and our hypothalamus. Um, we have cold receptors and warm receptors. Uh, they use the same pathways as pain receptors, but they quickly adapt. So pain does not really adapt. These temperature receptors, as we talked about with jumping into a cold lake, they do adapt pretty quickly. Again, you're, it's not anything that's going to be life-threatening. So your, your body, your brain allows those to adapt. And then there are a few different classes of mechanoreceptors that are found as general senses. There are those which are tactile, so they respond to touch. Baroreceptors respond to pressure. And proprioceptors respond to position. So tactile receptors are under the skin. Right? They're, in, they're in the dermis of the skin, they're kind of deeper, and there are a lot of different ones, right? There's six of them that are in the skin, and each of them does something a little bit different, but all of them involve either fine touch and pressure or deeper pressure and vibration, right? They're uh, deeper in your skin, and you can see here are, you know, there are different skin receptors. Um, there are baroreceptors. So the beginning of this word, baro, tells you it has to do with pressure, just like a barometer, right? Some people might have heard of a, of a barometer, which detects the pressure in the air. These monitor changes in pressure in an organ. So for example, blood vessels, right? Your lungs, your digestive, your urinary tracts. So, you know, you're monitoring your blood pressure all the time. You have these receptors in your uh, carotid arteries and in your aortic artery that that monitor your blood pressure all the time and they adjust the diameter of your blood vessels based on that pressure they respond immediately and they do adapt readily so if you have constant high blood pressure right your body is going to adapt to that and you're not going to constantly be responding to it that's when it can cause, that's when it can start to cause some problems. And this, this uh, figure just shows where the baroreceptors are in the body and what they do, right? What their actual functions are. Then we get the proprioceptors. Proprioceptors comes from the same word as proprioception. Proprioception is understanding where your limbs are in space. And so these monitor the position of your joints um, they monitor the tension of tendons. So remember, tendons join muscles to bones. So wherever there's a joint, there's a tendon there. And if the muscle is pulling really hard on that bone, that tendon is going to be really tense as well. And so the position of those joints is monitored in the state of muscle contraction. They are monitoring so that you don't do things like hyperextend your joints, right? you don't injure yourself. They do not adapt to constant stimulation. Again, so we've got pain receptors so far and proprioceptors that do not adapt. These are too important, right? You can't ignore that your arm is being stretched in the wrong direction or your leg is being stretched in the wrong direction. Um, your body just won't let that happen. Then another type of receptor that we find that are general senses are chemoreceptors and they are response to chemicals. So these, if we're talking about general senses, they detect small changes in the concentration of specific chemicals or compounds in your body fluids. Um, they adapt easily as well. Um, so for example, we have receptors in our brain that monitor the cerebral spinal fluid. They monitor the basically the concentration of hydrogen ions that are in the cerebral spinal fluid to, to monitor the pH of it. Um, we also have chemoreceptors 
that monitor how much carbon dioxide is in our blood, right? And they'll change your breathing patterns accordingly to try to get rid of more carbon dioxide or get more oxygen in. Okay, and so this just goes over where some of those receptors are and what they do. Then we get to special senses. So now we're done with general senses, which are all over the body. We get to spe special senses. The first one is the sense of smell. Olfaction is the sense of smell. These, these receptors are only in our nasal cavity. They're kind of at the top of our nasal cavity. Um, they are called olfactory receptor cells. Um, they do have supporting cells and basal cells around them that are just there for structural support. Um, two percent of your inhaled air is carried to your olfactory organs, so that's a really small percentage. But the repeated sniffing increases airflow and exposure to stimulation of olfactory receptors. So, what's going on? Well, here is our nose. Here's our nostrils. Right. Remember, air coming in is going to pass these. These are called nasal conchae. They're going to cause the air to swirl. Right, we, talk, we learned about these a little bit with the skeletal system. And hanging down kind of at the top of your nose, so this is your brain, hanging down from there through the top of that bone right there, that bone that's at the top of your nose, are the receptors that will respond to chemicals in the air. Right, so when you inhale air, some of that air has chemicals bound to it or in it. And those chemicals bind to these olfactory receptors and they carry messages to your brain. And that's where you interpret the sense of smell. And these, these little neurons that go through here, right? These little openings, they go through the ethmoid bone. There was something called the cribriform plate, which had all these little holes in it. Those holes are for these nerves to go through. Okay, so it's right at the base of your brain. And um, you probably remember the olfactory bulb looking something like this when you dissected the brain. The olfactory bulb is actually where these sensations go to, and they carry that message to your brain. Okay. Related to that is the sense of taste, right? So olfactory reception is chemicals in the air binding to receptors. Um, the sense of taste, which is called gustation, is also due to chemical receptors, chemoreceptors. Okay, we have these taste receptors, and most of them are found on our tongue. Um, there are some in our larynx and our pharynx, which is kind of the back of our mouth and our throat. But what happens is whenever you, let's go this way, whenever you swallow any food or drink, there are these taste buds on your tongue. And if we imagine this looking at it from the side, this is one taste bud here in purple. This is another taste bud in purple. And between them, there's kind of this opening or this crevice. And sticking out of that crevice are the taste hairs, right? So it's a taste bud, this is a papilla, which is just a bump. There's another taste bud with the papilla, and there are these hairs sticking out. The surface of your tongue is up here above the above that purple diagram. So whenever anything passes across your tongue, some of those molecules are going to drop down into this little channel. And when they do, they're binding to these taste hairs, okay, which are actually sticking out here, right? So you can see the taste hairs here. This would be this would be the, the kind of channel here between the two taste buds. And your taste hairs are sticking out. So what's going to happen as chemicals are moving across your tongue, some of them are going to drop down and bind to these taste hairs, which are going to stimulate, those are essentially just dendrites. They're going to stimulate these uh, transitional cells, and they're going to send, send that information through sensory neurons to your brain. So these taste hairs respond to chemicals that are in the solution that you eat or drink, and it triggers the change in membrane potential. Your brain in interprets that as a sense. There are 
primary taste sensations of sweet, sour, bitter, and salty, which I'm sure you guys have heard of. And most of our tastes, tastes come from some combination of these, right? The fifth one that's been found more recently is called umami. Um, umami is kind of this uh, bitter flavor that they, they you find a lot in, in meat. Um, you find it in mushrooms, certain, certain things like that. So that's what umami is. It doesn't quite fit into any of these other categories. So we've talked about smell and taste, both of those respond to chemicals. We talked about now is one of the most complex senses, which is the sense of vision. Um, vision is interpreted, or I'm sorry, vision is sensed by our eyes, right? We have photoreceptors in our eyes that respond to light hitting them. The eyeball itself is divided into two cavities. One is anterior, one is posterior. So one towards the front, one towards the back. The anterior one itself has two chambers, an anterior and a posterior chamber. So that's a little bit confusing. The front cavity has two chambers in it, a front and a back chamber within that front cavity. And that front cavity is filled with a very watery um, solution called aqueous humor. The back cavity, the posterior cavity, um, is filled with a more jelly-like fluid called vitreous body. So it's, it's, uh, it's more viscous. It's not as watery. Okay. The aqueous humor and the vitreous body help stabilize the shape of the eye. So it kind of keeps the, the pressure there for the eye to, uh, to stay that round shape that it is. Um, the wall of the eye is made of three distinct layers. You got an outer, a middle, and a deep layer. The outer layer is fibrous. The inner, the intermediate, the middle layer is vascular, meaning that it has a lot of blood vessels in it. And the deep layer is the retina. The retina, this deep layer, is the layer that has the photoreceptors on it. So here's an eye. From the side, here's one from the top. Right? First thing to notice, let's go over to the right here on the one, the view from the top. There's an anterior cavity and a posterior cavity. Anterior cavity is much smaller, right? The posterior cavity is much larger. The anterior cavity is divided further into an anterior and posterior chamber. Those are all within this little anterior cavity. The anterior cavity is filled with aqueous humor. The, the posterior cavity is much larger. It's the bulk of the eye, and it's filled with vitreous humor. The eye itself is made up of three layers. The outer layer, which is the fibrous layer, that's the white of your eye, right? The white of your eye is called the sclera. That outer layer, the sclera, continues across the front of the eye and in the front of the eye, it's completely clear. That's the cornea. So the cornea and the sclera, the clear part of the eye, the front of the eye, and the white of the eye are, are all one layer. They're one continuous layer. The intermediate layer, which they're showing kind of in this peach color here, is the vascular layer. Most of that is the choroid. You can see that from kind of on either side of the the uh, lens all the way around to the back, right? It's called the choroid. The choroid is where most of your blood vessels are. It extends to the ciliary bodies, which we'll talk about in a minute, and the iris. So the iris does count as part of this vascular layer. There's a lot of blood vessels going there. Um, the iris is the colored part of your eye, for those of you that are, are not familiar with that. The innermost layer, which they're showing in pink here, is the retina, okay? And that's the neural layer. That's the layer where the actual photoreceptors are, the, the cells that actually, when light hits them, they pick up the sense of vision. Okay? And then we're, we're looking at this here from the side. Um, what you're trying to do is get light to come through all these different structures that we'll talk about and focus right here at the back of the eye. 
Okay. So you want them to go through the, this is the, the front layer, the anterior, I'm sorry, the anterior cavity. This is the posterior cavity. Right? You can still see the three layers. The fibrous layer, vascular layer, and the inner layer. Okay, so again, they go through the fibrous layer in words here, the vascular layer, the um, in the inner layer. And so here is a superior view of the dissected eye, right? This is looking at the top and they've cut parts of it away. What they're showing you in yellow here, the visual axis, this is the pathway that you want light to take. You want light to go through the cornea, the aqueous humor, through the pupil, which is the hole in the middle of the, the iris, through the lens, through the vitreous humor, focus right at the back, right there at a place called the fovea centralis, right? That's, that's the place where you have the most photoreceptors, the highest concentration of photoreceptors. So when, when light hits right there, that's when it gives you the clearest picture, the most clear vision that you can have. That's a lot of things to pass through, right? And so, we have a lot of ways of accommodating this light. Just think about it. When, if you shine light, if you take a flashlight and you shine it at uh, a glass of water, when it hits that glass, the light's going to bend. And when it hits the water, the light's going to bend again. And when it comes through the other side, it's going to bend again. Right? It gets re refracted all the time. So you have to account for that. And you know there are a number of different ways. One thing that we can do, we have all these muscles that make up the iris of the eye. We can dilate our pupil or constrict our pupil. So if you're in an area where the light is dim, your pupil will enlarge, it'll get bigger so that you can take in more light because you need a certain amount of light to see things. If, it's, if you're in bright light, your pupils will constrict, they'll get really small so that they're limiting the amount of light that comes in. Your lens has muscles attached to it. You can see these muscles right here next to it, right? The, the ciliary muscles, which are the, these muscles that are next to the lens, they can pull the lens. So they can make the lens flatten out, right? Which changes the pathway of the light coming in. So as you move things or as you're focusing on things either further from your eye or closer to your eye, your, your muscles in your eye are automatically changing the shape of that lens or the width of that lens in hopes of getting all of this light to focus at the back of the eye. Okay. So the cells of the retina are called the photoreceptors. They detect light. We have two kinds. We have rods and cones. Um, the rods, enable us to see in dim light. They don't allow us to see color. And the cones detect color. They give a, a much sharper, clear image, but they require bright light. So think about it this way. If you, if you wake up in the middle of the night, right, and you have to use the bathroom or something, you, you wake up, you give yourself a minute or two, and you can see around your room, right? You can see the shadows in your room, things like that. You can't see the color of anything, but you can see enough that you can get up and walk around. That's because you're activating the rods. There's not enough light in the room to activate the cones. But if, you know, during the day, when there is plenty of light, you're outside in the middle of the day, you can see things nice and crisp and clear. There's nice bright colors, they're nice and clear. And that is due to the fact that the cones are detecting color. Now, we as humans, we have three different types or uh, three different colors of cones, I suppose, that we could see. And, and depending on how many cones get activated and the combinations of them, we see different colors. Um, there are animals that have less cones and animals that have more cones, or I should say less types of cones and more types of cones. Um, you may have heard in the past that dogs see black and white. They don't see black and white but they only have two types of cones, whereas we have three. So they can't see as many variations of color as, as we can. There are other, um, other animals. There's something called a mantis shrimp, 
which there's a lot of cool videos on you should go check out. Um, the mantis shrimp has, I think, like 14 different types of cones, and they can see colors that we can't even perceive of. Then there's this phenomenon of the optic disc. So I'm going to go back to this picture of the eye to show you that. So most of the light, we're trying to get most of the light to hit right here at the back of the eye. That's where our photoreceptors are. Just off the center, right, just to one side a little bit, is where the optic nerve leaves the eye. So all of this information from these cells getting hit with light is traveling through that optic nerve to our brain. Where the optic nerve actually leaves, there's a circle where it leaves. There are no photoreceptors there. That's called the optic disc, right? Because it looks like a disc, it looks like a circle. There are no photoreceptors there. So when light hits there, we can't see anything. It's a blind spot. Now, the fact that we have two eyes and our field of vision overlaps, right? What we see with one eye overlaps with what we see with the other eye makes up for that. So we don't ever notice that we have a blind spot, but we do actually have a blind spot. And here you can see, again, this is a little uh, more of a close-up view from the side of a, a redrawing. Again, you can see where all, all of the photoreceptors are in the retina. There are none right there where the optic nerve leaves. And this, this is an actual picture, an image of an eyeball, right? This darker area right here is the fovea centralis. That's where most of your photoreceptors are, are concentrated. But the, the blind spot is right here. That's where the optic nerve is leaving. There, there are no photoreceptors there. So any light that hits there doesn't produce an image. And there's a really cool experiment that you can do. And I wish we were in person so we could do this. But you can, um, you can take a printout of this sheet of paper, basically cover one eye and hold this thing in front of you and look at, kind of concentrate on one of these symbols and start pulling that image closer to you. The other symbol will disappear. And that's because it's the light from that other symbol is hitting your blind spot, your optic disc at that point. And by covering one eye, you are eliminating the information that's coming from that eye. Right. So normally we wouldn't see our blind spot. We wouldn't notice that we have a blind spot because our other eye makes up for it. But you can do, you can do these cool demonstrations. Uh, or at least I think they're interesting demonstrations on a blind spot. The lens, I showed you where the lens is. It lies behind the cornea. Um, its primary function is to focus visual images by changing the shape. So it's basically... It can be kind of stretched and flattened out, or it could be the, the muscles can relax and let it get kind of fat. And that will change where the light hits the back of your eye. And so all of this stuff is about light refraction and accommodation, right? So here, here we have just a normal eye. Here is the lens right here. The light's coming in the eye from the left here. It's coming through the lens and it's hopefully all focusing at this pink dot, which is representing your phobia centralis. Now, if you change the shape of the lens, you're gonna change the focal point, right? So if you have something that you're looking at that's pretty close to you, your lens is kind of stretched out so that your focal distance or your focal point is here. If you move something further away from you, right, the lens is going to get fatter and you're going to change that focal distance. Right? The rounder the lens, the shorter the focal distance. So the closer the light source, the greater the angle of arriving light is, the longer the focal distance. So as you move something closer to you, you're going to stretch your lens out to make that focal distance longer so that you can see things more clearly, right? So again, for distant vision, this is for the, looking at things further away, the ciliary muscles are gonna relax, the lens is gonna flatten out. 
if you're looking at something closer, these muscles are going to contract and that's going to give you more of a round lens and that's going to change the focal point. Because, because you always want that focal point to be right at the back of the eye. That's where you have the most receptors for that light. And then all of that is just to perceive an image, right? But you're getting an image from your right eye going to your left brain. You're getting an image from your left eye going to the right side of your brain. And then your brain has to form an image from that, right? It has to form what, what that is. And so you, what you see, you see upside down and your brain has to flip it back over. Um, what your brain sees is upside down and backwards and your brain compensates without us being consciously aware of it. Um, so here's, here's kind of a uh, picture to kind of try to explain that. Here's somebody looking at a light pole, right? And you can see that it, the way the image forms, the way it comes through the lens, it flips over and it flips over and it also flips left to right. You can see where this, um, this transformer is on the, on the pole, changes sides. And then your brain automatically flips that over. Your brain also merges what you see with your, with your eyes together so that you only see one image, right? You don't see double vision. Um, there are some cool experiments about this too. You can you can look up experiments with um, what are they called? They're glasses that flip over the image. So there was a researcher that wanted to study this kind of thing, and he made these glasses that when the subject put them on, all the images, everything they see would be flipped. Right. So you would put these glasses on and you would see things upside down. Within a few hours, your brain will compensate and flip them back over. So you wear these glasses. After a few hours of wearing these glasses, your brain figures, figures out how to flip the image a second time to make it look right to you. And then if you take the glasses off, everything's upside down until your brain figures out how to flip it back. It's, it's a really interesting experiment that, that was done to kind of come up with that um, or elucidate that. And then there are all kinds of refractive problems, right? Um, astigmatism, myopia, hyperopia, presbyopia. Um, myopia and hyperopia are kind of the two that are the most common things. They're nearsighted and farsightedness. So if you're myop, myopic, you have nearsightedness. That means you can see things close up. As they get further away, they're harder to see. And oftentimes this comes from the eye being too long. So here, right, and they're comparing the eye to a camera here because it works similarly to a camera. Here you have a normal eyeball and you have an object here in front of the eye. The light coming off that object passes through all these structures in the eye, focuses right at the back of the eye. That's what you want. If your eyeball is too long, that focal point is going to be here. Your photoreceptors are back here. So what you have to do is put a lens in front of the eye, right, a concave lens that will change the focal point to the back. If you are farsighted, oftentimes it's because the eye is too short. So again, your focal point is back here where your photoreceptors are here. It's still out of focus here. So you put, a, um, you put a convex lens in front of the eye and it, it changes the focal point. If somebody has an astigmatism, they usually have um, more than one kind of bend in this cornea. And so they have to have a lens that's partially concave and partially convex to fix that problem. All right. So that's the eye. So now we're going to get to the ear, talk about hearing and equilibrium. Um, what I'm going to do is actually just go to this drawing. I, most of it I'll just talk about on this drawing. So we'll start off just thinking about hearing. I always just think of the ear as a big funnel. So anytime a sound is made, it creates a, a wave or a ripple in the air. 
And the ear is just funneling that ripple in toward, toward your brain. And the receptors that are hearing that are in your ear. They're called, they're in your inner ear, right? So they're in towards your brain. The ear itself is divided into an external, a middle, and an inner ear. The external ear is, is kind of what you think of, right? It's, the, it's your ear that's on the side of your head. That's called your oracle, right? Or sometimes called the pinna. And it's your external acoustic meatus. That's your ear canal. That's all your external ear. Your middle ear starts at the tympanic membrane. I lost my question for you there. The middle ear starts at the tympanic membrane. Tympanic membrane is your eardrum. Right? So everything outside of your eardrum is your external ear. Your middle ear is your eardrum, and these three tiny bones called auditory ossicles. Right. You have the incus, the malleus, and the stapes. And what happens is a vibration comes in and it vibrates in your external acoustic meatus, in your ear canal. It vibrates your eardrum back and forth. And in doing so, that vibrates the first bone, which is attached to the eardrum. When the first bone vibrates, the second bone vibrates. When the second bone vibrates, the third bone vibrates. And the whole reason is that your cells that are responsible for hearing are in this snail-shaped structure here called the cochlea. And so you are trying to take that vibration, which is out here, outside the external ear, and transfer it into those cells in your cochlea. Well, this third bone, the stapes, is touching the cochlea and it's touching the cochlea at what's called the oval window. So when it vibrates back and forth, it sends vibrations through the cochlea. And the cochlea is filled with fluid and the receptors that allow for hearing. And so that vibration shakes those receptors back and forth. And based on how frequently they shake, so how what the speed is and how much, how big of a amplitude there is, that gives you the perception of different sounds. The frequency, the higher the frequency, usually the higher pitch you hear. And the amplitude is something louder, right? That has to do with how loud you hear something. And those, those signals get transmitted through these nerves here, which is that nerve is called the vestibulocochlear nerve. And part of that is the word cochlea, right? So part of that nerve comes from your cochlea. And that's, that's exactly how hearing happens. Now, there are a few other things here. One of them is that your ear is also responsible for equilibrium, the sense of equilibrium. And it is a sense, even though we don't hear of it as a sense when we're, when we're young. The sense of equilibrium is detected by these semicircular canals. Right? And where these semicircular canals kind of connect to this, um, this cochlea here, that's called the vestibule. Right? So this part of the cochlea, kind of before it gets to that snail-shaped part. These semicircular canals, you have three of them. You have one of them that goes up and down, vertical, one that's horizontal, and one that's at an angle. They are filled with liquid. And each of them is filled with liquid and has a bubble in it. And they act the same way that a carpenter's level acts. So if, you know, if I'm using a carpenter's level, it's, uh, it's usually a plastic thing that kind of looks like a two by four. And it's got a little, um, a little oval window in the middle that's filled with liquid and it has a bubble in it. And as you move the ends of this two by four in one direction or the other, the bubble moves side to side. Right, and so if you have this thing perfectly level, the bubble will be right at the center. That same concept works for our semicircular canals. As we turn our head, that little air bubble inside there moves from one side to another. And this rotational movement of our head gets transmitted through these nerves, 
which are part of the vestibule, right? Which go to this vestibular cochlear nerve. So vestibulo is from the vestibule, cochlear is from the cochlea, right? And this nerve is transmitting the sense of equilibrium and the sense of hearing from our ear to our brain. That is cranial nerve number eight, right? That's why there's an eight in Roman numerals there. So we have a bunch of structures of the ear for hearing. We have these semicircular canals connected to the vestibule for equilibrium. It's really detecting rotation of your head. The last thing to point out here is this eustachian tube, what they call an auditory tube here. And it says to the nasopharynx. The nasopharynx is an opening behind your nose and your mouth. And so your ears are connected behind your nose and your mouth, right? Oftentimes, if you, if you go to a doctor that's a specialist in this, they're called an ear, nose, and throat doctor because ear, nose, and throat are all connected. They're all related. Um, this opening right here, this auditory tube, is called the eustachian tube a lot of times. That's probably it may be what you've heard of it more at. The eustachian tube is a remnant of our gill. When you were in the womb, when you're in your mother's womb, you were in a liquid environment. You did not use your lungs to breathe. You used gills. And these, these are the gills. So when an infant is born, this is very, very narrow. Sometimes it's just a slit, right? And it widens as we age, as we grow. It's why oftentimes little kids, infants and toddlers get ear infections. You can think about down here, that's connected to your nasal cavity and, and behind your mouth. Well, where do we normally get infections, right? You get an infection in your nasal cavity, right? You get a nasal infection or a sinus infection. That's pretty easy to get. We get colds all the time. Well, if that works its way up, that infection works its way up this tube, it's not that hard to think about, right? This is all open. That's going to give you an infection in this auditory tube. And it's going to hurt your ears because it's going to be pushing on your tympanic membrane from the inside, right? It's going to be pushing with pressure from the inside on your tympanic membrane. If you've ever heard of people getting tubes in their ears, this is where they get the tube, right? Not, not from the outside. They go in through your mouth, basically, and through the inside and put the tubes in. And most of the time when they put those in, uh, when people are, are toddlers or children, as they grow, as the person grows, the tubes will fall out, right? Because this will widen enough that the tube will fall out. And the reason they put those in there is just to keep that opening nice and, and wide or somewhat wide so that, um, so that there's less of a chance of an infection building up in there. Think about this too. Think about when you fly in an airplane, right? The cabin that you're in is pressurized. There is pressure being pumped into that cabin. Well, that pressure, right? We, we always do things to try to get your ears to pop. That's what we say, get your ears to pop. So you do things like you chew gum or you yawn, open your mouth a lot. Well, if we think about it, that pressure is coming from the outside. It's coming in your ear and it's pushing against your tympanic membrane. What you're trying to do is get the pressure of the, the cabin to also come through your mouth and your nose, come through this side and equalize on the inside of your eardrum. Until you do that, it's going to feel, it's going to hurt. It's gonna feel like somebody's pushing on your eardrum from the outside. But once you can equal that from the inside, then it's comfortable. Right, then you, you no longer have that, that feeling or that pain associated with it. So for the ear, I, I usually just teach the ear with, from this drawing, there are, you know, there are slides with words that go through all those things that I just said in a little bit more probably. Um, please go through those, please dissect those, or please go through those pictures and look through those pictures, make sure you understand them. 
we are going to dissect the eye, right, as our next experiment. So the dissection of the eye, I do have some demo videos posted. Um, I have to get on there and post a few, you know, a few questions where you can take some pictures of the eye and um, post those just like you did with the brain so that we can get, you know, some, I can grade something, I can have something to grade for your lab for the eye. Um, I did push the due date off a little bit on the eye so that hopefully we can do some of that together on Friday. So the plan is to meet on Friday at 930. Um, if, you know, some of you want to do the eye, I know, uh, I know a couple of you did the brain with me on Friday so that you could go through and kind of ask questions. Am I supposed to be looking at this this way or that way and that sort of thing. So let's plan on doing that. Um, and if you have any questions between now and then, please email me and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. And I just hope everybody has a great day. Talk to you soon.